watch this vidcast or I'll gouge your eyes out. Welcome back, horror hounds, to Ghostman and Rivera's Horror Show Podcast. I'm Mike Ghostman Pickle. And I'm James Rivera. We have an interview today with Joe Castro, who is a very accomplished uh, uh, special effects makeup artist and filmmaker. But before we get to that, we have a little announcement to make. Yeah, we got the very sad news that on April 29th, the co-writer of Child's Play, John Lapia, committed suicide at age 63. And this is devastating. He not only co-wrote Child's Play, a classic slasher film, he also directed Child's Play 2, which is arguably the best of the series. And he also wrote and directed Man's Best Friend in 93 with Lance Hendrickson, the killer dog movie. This is really sad because from what I understand, he had two kids that he left behind. And <laughs> and it's, it's something deeply upsetting because I feel we all can relate to that at some point where we in our lives where we've reached the bottom and we feel that there's nowhere else to go. If you ever feel like that, anybody in the audience out there, don't, don't, don't give into it. There's always a better way. It's always better to live your life to the fullest extent possible. Please try to reach out to somebody if you're feeling, if you have any kind of thoughts like this or you're having feeling negative. Call the suicide hotline if you're not, if you don't feel comfortable speaking to anybody about your problems, but just reach out. Don't, yeah. don't do it. It's not worth it. A, a man, an artist with a legacy like that and leaving behind two kids, it's unimaginable how much pain he must have been in when he did that. So, and how alone he must felt. So, he must have felt. So, if if you, if any of you that are listening to this or watching this, if you feel alone, reach out. Even if it feels like it's not, it's not going to help. I know when you're feeling those feelings, it feels like nothing's going to help. It's never going to end. Just reach out. Talk about it. You'll be surprised how much it'll help you. Yes, and a very a something that upset both of us because I've dealt with depression before, and Mike, you've I know you've had your own bouts with depression, and I think a lot of people who are artists kind of feel that or or go, or go through that. But at the end of the day, life is worth living. I truly yeah. believe that it is a gift to be alive and to be here on this planet. Yeah, we're all in this thing called life together, and there's no reason any one of us should feel so alone that we feel like we need to leave this earth. So please reach out. Uh, we'll, we'll post the suicide hotline on this uh, podcast. We'll, we'll put it in the comments and everything. So please reach out, whether it's a friend, a family, or even us. Reach out to us. We're, we're there for anybody who, who needs it. Yeah. So please, please don't don't suffer alone like this. And don't uh, do what this man did and just give up because I, I know it must have been painful. And I know it's painful to, to even think about reaching out when you're feeling those feelings, but just do it. Just yeah. reach out. And I would like to, we send our deep <clears throat> condolences to his loved ones and the family and the uh, people that he, he left behind. So, so I know we started the podcast off on a very sad and somber note, but Mike and I felt this was an important message that we needed to get out there because his death resonated with us so much. But like we said, life is worth living and we're going to celebrate life. And on that note, we would like to introduce to you our interview with Joe Castro. Please enjoy. Horror show exclusive. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome Joe Castro to the podcast. Hello, everybody. Hey, Hello. James, Mike. How are you Good doing? Good to uh, meet you here virtually uh, online. Yes. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know, Joe Castro is a special effects artist, makeup artist, writer, director, producer, and editor. That's correct. That's correct. Friday the 13th, Vengeance. Vengeance. Yeah, Vengeance. That's uh, it's on your uh, Is that something uh, you're working on right now? Actually, that's a, a fan film that came out um, last year, and it was uh, directed and produced by Jeremy Brown, and Jason Brooke stars as uh, Jason in the film, mm -hmm. and uh, my good friend Don Shell was uh, one of the producers on the film, and uh, yeah, it was shot up in, um, I want to say Washington, <laughs> I forget where was that, they flew me up there, and it was an amazing experience working with this giant crew of people. Uh, on, on a fan film. It was like bigger than most regular movies I work on here in Hollywood. There was probably, I don't know, 30 or 40 people on set and uh, it was just a great experience, yeah. 
really nice people. Yeah. I, like, so I just wanted to mention some of your credits so that so the audience will be familiar with your work. Uh, as far as the special effects artist, you did Uncle Sam, Night of the Demons 3, Blood Feast 2, Bone Hill Road, Iron Sky, The Coming Race, and 29 upcoming projects. How in the hell do you have 29 upcoming projects? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think the reason why I have 29 upcoming projects is because I have been doing this for 38 years and I know exactly what I'm doing. You know, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I've I, let's put it this way. I've done it enough to know what not to do. Uh. <laughs> and eventually, you know, you get to a point where you know, you know exactly what needs to be done. Whether or not the director on set wants to listen to me is his own prerogative, but uh, when people come to me to work on their films, they're looking for something specific. They're looking for an incredible level of detail, uh, probably something truly original that's never been done before, and something that could be uh, accomplished, uh, you know, within the confines of the budget that they have to work with. But more importantly, uh, they're looking for for someone who has experience. They can they can solve a, some sort of um, I don't want to call it a problem. It can solve some sort of puzzle that they, they that they have yet to figure out themselves you know and they come to me to do the impossible so you've been doing this since you were 15 years old your career started off really early how right. old were you when you realized that this is what you wanted to do and you were going to get into this that's a great question well when i was seven years old and this is a, a fairly familiar story among amongst my friends and some of the people that know me when i was seven years old <clears throat> my mother had gone away on a, uh, like a cruise a trip with uh, her friends from work on a weekend and my father was babysitting me at home and we lived on a very large ranch in, in uh, Texas, uh, in, in Helotus, Texas. And he was doing uh, work on the ranch uh, that was dangerous and he decided to leave me inside uh, to babysit me. He sat me in front of the TV and he said, watch this son, I know you're gonna love it. Uh, you know, and as a young man, I, uh, I grew up liking dragons and dinosaurs and so he, and he knew this. And, uh, and he put me in front of the TV on a Saturday afternoon and I saw Godzilla versus the Smog Monster. Uh. And this was, in, this was in 1977. And it was actually Godzilla versus the Smog Monster. And I, I, I don't know if this is completely correct, but to my knowledge, it's the darkest Godzilla film ever made. That's because Godzilla almost dies in the film at one point. Mm -hmm. And the monster almost kills him and like suffocates him. And it, you, know, you really think he's gonna die. Um, and um, when that movie was over, I just, I like, I knew exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I wanted to make monsters and make special effects and make movies that had monsters and special effects in it. And I never looked back. Yeah. It's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, your earliest passion was uh, makeup effects and stuff. So when did it spread to other aspects of filmmaking, like directing and producing? Well, I think, I think it all kind of happened at the same time. In fact, the same year that I, I was already making like monster masks out of paper mache and uh, making puppets out of, you know, like cloth and cereal boxes and stuff like that. And when I was 10 years old, my mother bought me a, 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 a college level, level art book. Uh, that, that's like, like, like an art level of art 101 in, in college. And uh, by the end of my school year that year, I think I was in, I'm gonna say 10 years, like I said, 10 years old. I was like 10 years old. I had already completed every project in that book by the end of that school year oh. and so um and there were stuff like you know making a, a dinosaur dinorama with like a full landscape with like tropical dinosaur plants and the whole bit was in there there was a uh, thing where we actually made like this paper mache like china like plates and maracas and stuff and so i did all that stuff i went through the book my mother was a school teacher and she taught me how to teach myself and then by the time i was 12 years old uh two things happened that year one VHS retail video cameras hit the market for the retail uh, consumer. Uh, JVC and Sony both put out video cameras and uh, I begged and pleaded with my parents to buy me a video camera because I had taken a puppet class in San Antonio, Texas. We made puppets and then we videotaped the puppets. We made a little movie and they shot it with like a, it wasn't a consumer grade camera, but it was, uh, it, was a, it was it was like an in-between. I don't know how they got it. But it maybe it was something from a television station that had a smaller video camera. So I begged my parents to buy me a VHS camera. And uh, at the time it cost $2,200. That was in 1982. So I think it's like, that's like a $6,000, $7,000 purchase, you know, if you, if, you, if you figured it out, like how much it would cost today. And um, when they bought me that video camera, 
that same year, I also got a book uh, for my birthday. Uh, my um, my second, uh, my third cousin, his name was Eddie Perez. He since passed away. He had a heart attack and died. But that man basically catapulted me to right where I needed to be in order to make my dream happen. And he bought me a book for my birthday. And it was Cinemagic issue number six. And you can still Google it online today. It's Cinemagic in issue number six. And most special effects artists that are my age will know exactly what I'm talking about. And in this magazine, it gives you step-by-step -step instructions of how to make your own rubber mask. That's all, the way from making, all the way from taking a life cast of a person, sculpting it in clay, making a two-piece mold, and pouring it up in rubber and painting it. The whole thing is in this book. And uh, by, the top, you know, by the end of that year, I had made my first rubber mask, and my parents bought me a, a VHS, a portable VHS video camera. With a, uh, it had like a battery pack, and you could charge it up, and we could we could run around the property and make uh, horror films, and um, it was uh, you know I, I looking back, it was I was very blessed, and you know I want I'm not going to go into morbid detail, but I also <laughs> had a very traumatic childhood. I mean, you got you got both sides of the spectrum here, you know, um, and uh, I was I just want to say that like I survived my childhood, that going growing up in the like 70s and 80s. It was a different time than it is today, you know. Teachers and parents could put their hands on children, and uh, I, I grew up with a, as a, in a very different time frame. And uh, so I, I believe like I was given gifts to pay for other people's sins and what they had done to me. Uh, uh, but yes, I had these amazing things presented to me, but 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 but, but on the on the backs of the um, of the guilt and shame and remorse of others. Mm -hmm. So I can't have one without the other, you know. I couldn't have yeah. one if I wanted to endure extreme uh, bliss and happiness. There's also going to be some extreme pain and suffering that came along with it. Well, that's perfect because everything is part of what made you who you are. That's exactly right. So the first job you got was as doing makeup for PBS when you were 15 years old, correct? That's right. How did you land that job as a 15 year old doing makeup for a network like that? That's a good question. When I was now, I, 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 when you're 12 years old and you can make your own, like, basically, depending on, it's still a movie, a studio quality rubber mask. It's the same technique. When you're 12 years old and you can do that, word gets around. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, would make, uh, what, what I would do is I would design on paper, like mazes for haunted houses, because every year I'd have a Halloween party and someone caught wind of this and the local paper picked up this story. And San Antonio is a really big city, you know. I live right outside of San Antonio, so the, there were two competing uh, newspapers in San Antonio, and they picked up the story that there was this young man, and he knows how to do special effects. And uh, I had won a, uh, when I was 15 years old, I won a national special effects makeup contest that was put on by Monsterland Magazine. And if you don't know what Monsterland Magazine is, Monsterland Magazine is a magazine that was founded by the original sci-fi nerd ever, like ever. His name was Forrest J. Ackerman. And if you don't know who Forrest J. Ackerman is, he made a magazine called uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland. And, his, mm -hmm. and he, he spawned another magazine called Monsterland. And it was for younger readers. Mm -hmm. you know? And so the magazine uh, had a contest. And, it, and it, what it did, it ran a contest that allowed people like they were 18 and younger. I, mean, I think maybe it had to be 17 and younger to enter a makeup effects contest. And I won that contest. They flew me out to Hollywood. I got to meet like Joe Dante. Uh, John Carl Beekler, Doug Beswick, when they were working on Evil Dead 2. I went to the special effects shop when they were working on Evil Dead 2. I got to see the, that, that giant pumpkin-headed demon that comes through the door at the end. I, I was there when they had finished it, and I wanted to get my picture taken with it. And they couldn't do it. They go, we can't let you take a picture with it because this isn't the climax of the film. we got to keep it a secret. I saw like all the little um, stop-motion models of like the girl with the, the headless girl dancing around, and all the miniatures. They were shooting it at Doug Beswick's shop and the little trees that hit the house and all that stuff. Um, I got a chance to, uh, I, I was like the first person to have their picture taken with a RoboCop car. You know that SUX 6000? They were literally yeah. just pulling it out of the shop and I have a picture of it on my page, on my Facebook page. Uh, and they were just rolling it out of the shop. It's the same shop that made the Batman car for the TV series. And they made that RoboCop car and they took me over there. So I was you know, taking around Hollywood and they uh, got to meet a lot of people. I met Frank Stevens. She's one of my best friends. She's a screen queen. She's been in over 200 movies. Uh, I made good friends with Saban Gray, who's also worked on the magazine. Got to meet Forrest J. Ackerman. And uh, Forey, um, you know, Forey eventually became the star of my first feature film. 
and he oh. he put me in. I think it was the last issue of Famous Monsters of Film Man as an upcoming director. So I got to make it into the magazine before it went out of print、uh, that I grew up reading. Oh, and、uh, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a, a very honored and very、um, blessed to have had that opportunity. So getting back to how I got to do.、Uh, How 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 what, what was the, the question was、yes. how did I how how, how did I get so 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 anyways everybody knew about it everybody knew that I was doing this stuff I was 15 years old and it was kind of a big deal because I was 15 years old and the local March of Dimes and the Muscular Dystrophy Association were huge they're they're huge nonprofit organizations worldwide but in San Antonio they were really huge and they would each literally hire me nonprofit they they would hire me to come and design and build their haunted houses each year. And they would raise a lot of money, and、uh, because I was such a young person, and you know, you, you, get, you get all the newspapers involved, and you get、um, all these、um, businesses got involved. Home Depot, all the makeup special effects companies I used to order my my supplies from got involved. They would just donate everything. I would get like, you know, like thousands and thousands of dollars worth of lumber to build the walls and rubber to come in, and I'd make monster masks for everybody, and、um, it was a big success each year, and.、Um, Uh, you know, but that that that's kind of how my name got out there really fast. And PBS reached out to me and said, "Hey, we're doing this this thing, and we need to transform a, like a I think it was like a fifteen、like、someone who's fifteen too. We need to transform this fifteen year old into different stages of age. I need like twelve of them." And、uh, I said, "I'll do it." You know, and、uh, so and we, I would you know I would do stuff like put mustaches on him and draw, draw jowls and make his hair gray and. I had like one day to do this, and I was just like, you know, doing all these different,、uh, different、uh, stages of age that I could think of. But、um, I don't have any pictures of it. I wish I did. I'm sure it was kind of goofy and funny and over the top, like SNL or something.、Uh, but yes, it was a great experience, and I got my first check that year. You know, as a special effects artist, that was the first time someone wrote me a check and paid me for my, my services. So since you started your career in Texas and got all those opportunities right away when you're at a young age, so what prompted you to move to LA in '89? That's a good question. That's a good question. So、um, back in the day, before Facebook and MySpace and the internet, you used to literally have to write on a piece of paper and put it in the mail, and you have to wait and see if it got to the other person, and then they could call you or you know whatever. But、um, I used to pen pal with people all over the United States and、uh, young people that wanted to make special effects. And、um, <clears throat> eventually, some of those people that I was were, were talking to made it out to Los Angeles, and they were struggling themselves to find work. So they, in turn, asked everybody else who they were talking to to come out to LA and join them, so we could all get together and be a team, and maybe we could find work that way because it was very difficult. For like an individual person to key a special effects show by themselves,、um, you know, you had like Steve Johnson shop with all his people and Rick Baker shop with all his people, Stan Winston shop with all his people, and so we were kind of like at the end of it. You know, I, I'm like at this weird age where we yeah we grew up watching 80s and 90s films, but there was no one there for us to invite us into the into the special effects、uh, shop at the time. At least that's the way I, it was presented to me. And、um, so we, we、uh, a whole bunch of my friends formed a little special effects shop, and、uh, we did our best to bring in work and keep busy and and、uh, and help each other. We all learn from each other, you know. So what what prompted me to was just like, hey Joe, I got a job. You want to come out here? And it was the first chance we got. We loaded all of our stuff in a U-Haul and drove drove vehicles out here. And、uh, when I got here, what do you think happened? Uh, there's no work. <laughs>、uh, <laughs> literally, literally, the day I arrived,、uh, the job fell through. They didn't give us the money to do the show. Oh no! So you know, and here I was. I didn't have any job. I had, I think, I had like eleven hundred dollars in my pocket, and I had a roommate、uh, who also wanted to be a special effects artist. And、um, the first job I got was picking up cigarette butts at Universal Studios in the theme park. Oh, that's、yeah. a start. That's yeah, a start. yeah, yeah. And、uh, and then and my and my roommate. Got a job working at、um, I want to say Michael's Art Store,、uh, framing in the framing department.、Uh. And、he did that for three months and then he moved back home. And、um, uh, I stayed. I just you know I stayed. And it took me about eleven months before I got my first job. I worked for、uh, my first key position where I keyed the show was for Fred Olin Ray. He gave me my first chance. If you don't know who Fred Olin Ray is, Google him. 
you check out his movies. He's an amazing, inspiring, independent filmmaker, and he's done a lot of mainstream stuff as well, a lot of commercial stuff on television. And um, and he gave me my first shot as a key artist on a movie titled Evil Tunes, and I'll never forget that set. And he, uh, I'm honored and blessed to say that Fred is still my friend today. This very day, and still inspires me. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Your first film was Ceremony. Uh, how did that come about, and what were like <laughs> the biggest challenge of getting your first uh, your right. first film off the ground? All right, it's a great question. So Ceremony was my first uh, feature length directing gig, and um, you know, <gasps> back in the day, <laughs> in 1993, there was no. You could shoot movies on 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 VHS and try to get them distributed, but no one was going to distribute them. Blockbuster or Hollywood Video was not going to pick them up. They certainly weren't going to be shown on cable or any sort of network television, and the and foreign countries weren't going to pick it up. Um, so uh, you had to shoot a movie on film, and it had to be shot 35 millimeter. Uh, at the time, I had a good friend. He's still my. He's actually still one of my best best friends today. I see him every year for New Year's. His name is Steve Gaynor. He's a um, he's a, uh, a guild. Uh, not, uh, he's a he's a uh, director of photography uh and um he is such an accomplished man amazing um friend and he worked in the paramount pictures photo department now the photo department is not the camera department it's the photo department it's where you get and receive like pictures to get developed and you know like people in the studio system would bring in their pictures like from home you know to get developed and uh, I guess maybe some productions would send in the stills to get developed on on set, and they would develop the the photos. And um, he um, made good friends with uh, someone over at Panavision. And when the time came, he asked if they, they could help him get us a Panavision camera. And uh, I think we all we had to do was pay for the insurance on the camera. And uh, Panavision donated, uh, I think, two weeks worth of Panavision rental to us for free as long as we paid for the insurance on the camera. And uh, all the film stock, uh, to shoot a 35 millimeter motion picture, if you just shot a one-to-one -one shooting ratio, that's not even with like action, cut, it's just the shot. 90 minutes worth of 35 millimeter film costs $75,000. That's just to buy the film. That does not include developing and transfer. So you see, not anybody could make a movie. Just not, not anybody could make a movie, shot on film. Well, everybody today that makes these like digital films and stuff, you know, it's they would never have been able to do it back then. So uh, on all the short ends that were brought in to the photo lab, and um, sh you know what, sh short ends are pieces of film that are unused after they're loaded into the camera at the end of a day of filming on like a studio lot. And let's say they say, okay, that's a wrap for today, and you got about ten minutes worth of film left in the camera. They would cut it there and they would pull out the unused film and put it back in the fridge and they would sell them as short ends. Well, eventually the fridge would get loaded up with short ends and they would have to throw the old ones out. So instead of just throwing them away, Steve would bring them home and put them in the fridge and that's what we shot our movie with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You shoot, so you shoot on digital now? Say that again? You shoot on digital now? I do, I do. I, that was the only film I shot on 35 millimeter. It was such a monster. I mean, it was such a monster to make that film. Not only did you have to pay for the film stock, we didn't pay for it, so we got $75,000 worth of it for free. Uh, and then the developing we had to pay for, um, but you also had to pay for it to be transferred to digitally. Then you had to pay for the film to be stored in a cool environment. That's mm. like a rental system. you know. And if you had a negative, the negative couldn't be stored in your garage. I mean, it could if you wanted it to be, but then it would be destroyed over the heat of the summer if you didn't have it in a controlled environment. It's a big ordeal. So after that, I never shot, I never shot 35 again. And you know, it's uh, to be honest with you, shooting on film is literally the number one most wasteful thing we do for the environment. That's why they stopped doing it. People don't know that. It takes 11 minutes worth of clean running water to develop one second, one second or one minute worth of film. Wow. <clears throat> so in uh, in 2011, you did a film called The Summer of Massacre. Yes. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records for the highest body count in the slasher film was 155 deaths That's did correct. you know that you were, did you know that you were going to break the record beforehand or i yes i set out to do that yes i did uh -huh. i did it was really hard keeping it quiet the, the summer of massacre was uh i'm so very proud of the film it's a big accomplishment um when it was released the year it came out uh the, the first two months it came out it was the most pirated movie on youtube 
we could not uh, take it down. We could not take it down. It just kept going up and everybody was sharing it with everybody. Everybody wanted to see it. And uh, it was a little, I think it was a little ahead of its time in 2012. Like with today, Adult Swim has become a real, like it's very popular and the film is very stylized. It's a very stylized horror film. It has a lot of CGI in it, uh, but it is still very dark and very gross. And I was going to school at the time uh, to learn computer generated effects and after effects over at Video Symphony in Burbank, California. So all of my classwork is basically in the film. Uh, but um, yeah, when I started making the film with my partner, Steven Escobar, we were like, what can we do to really make this film stick? And it's like, let's, let's set a Guinness Book of World Record. How many kills can we do? And, um, you know, we just got as many people involved as we possibly could. And uh, it was kind of a big, big, big feat, a big ordeal. But and I have to, I have to um, give a shout out to my best friend, Schroeder, uh, the owner of Cult Movies Magazine, who was also a co-producer on the film and helped us bring in the high body account. Uh, a lot of my partners, Steven Escobar, could not have done that. Movie without them. But it's available right now on Amazon Prime if you want to check it out. If you'd like to see more than one death every minute, go watch <laughs> The Summer of Massacre. That is 155 kills in the movie's 98 minutes. Nice. <laughs> Damn, that's fucking crazy. Is this the movie you're most proud of? Uh, you know, I have a couple of proud, proud moments. Uh, I'm absolutely 100% proud of the Summer of Massacre. I, I, every time I, you know, I'm sitting on the couch with my partner, Steven, who I've been with for 22 years now. We've made 10 feature, 11 feature films together. Um, you know, I'm very proud of it. Of course, you always want to go back as an artist and refine. And, uh, and I was just learning, you know, just learning the CGI stuff. So when I watch it today, I cringe, but you know, <laughs> it is what it is. And what can you do? I mean, uh, I, you know, you don't know until you, you know, you don't know, you don't know until you know, you know, and I, I, I and we were trying to make that movie all by ourselves. It's very difficult to make a movie by yourselves. I'm very proud of that one, but I'm also very proud of Blood Thieves 2, uh, a movie that is the sequel to the very first slasher movie ever made. Most people don't know that. So most people think that the, the, the first slasher movie ever made is like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something like that. It's not. The very first slasher movie ever made was produced in 1963 by Herschel Gordon Lewis. And it's a fact. It's just a fact. Uh, the the storyline goes, a deranged killer stalks innocent victims one by one, mutilating and killing each one on camera in a horrific death. And then the, at the end of the movie, the killer dies at the hands of the hero or heroine of the movie in an even more horrific death. Have you ever heard of that storyline before? That's the, premise, <laughs> that's the premises of every slasher movie ever made. Yeah. And, um, and Herschel made that movie back in 1963. Uh, in 1964, I think uh, a, an Italian filmmaker copied it and, and, try, and, and, and tries to claim to be the first slasher movie ever made, but it's not, it's Herschel's. So uh, when I got the chance to do the sequel, uh, do the effects of the sequel uh, with Herschel, it was uh, amazing, lifelong accomplishment. I, you know, I don't even know how to put into words the gratitude and um, the gift that was given me. You know, Herschel was, became my mentor and he, uh, I don't even know how to explain it. He's just, he's an amazing man. This man could come and sit with young filmmakers or anyone and show them how to be a better person. He could show them how to be professional. He could show them how to make their horror movies even better just by being the, the kind man that he is. You know, and that's what he did. Um, he showed me how to make my gore even gorier. I, that's even possible, <laughs> you know. I like. Well, I, I was I was looking through your credits and I realized a crazy coincidence. I first I'm a writer, director, producer myself, and I first got into filmmaking around 2007, 2008, and we did a little experiment just to see if I could do it. So we did a little experiment called Playbox 420. It's a dumb, dumb little comedy. And we needed something to go between some scenes where we kind of messed up with the uh, filming. So I got this movie, Terror Tunes. It's an awesome little movie. And then I find out that you wrote, directed it, and did all the special effects. I love that movie. How did Terror Tunes come about? That's a, that's a great question. I'm probably most proud of Terror Tunes. Now, Terror Tunes, uh, some, some people may know, it was a movie shot in three days. We shot the whole movie in three days. And, um, you know, I was inspired to make a movie in three days by Herschel and by um, Roger Corman and the studios. Back in the 50s and 60s, they shot whole movies in three days. And uh, there's, a, there's a man, his name is Kelly Green. 
he directed a movie called Attack of the Bat Monsters, and I had the honor of making the actual bat monster in the film. And it's not a horror film. It's a, it's a period piece film about the making of a science fiction horror film back in the, in the, in the 60s when the science fiction films were coming out. Maybe the late 50s, it's black and white. And um, uh, I shot, I shot, we shot that movie in Austin, Texas. And in the film, they're making a movie in three days. On a movie, on a movie set that's uh, in a location that the studios use. And they're these independent filmmakers. And they're, and they're basically, they found the window of opportunity when the studios weren't going to be on set for three days. So they ran into this location to like guerrilla style shoot on it. And um, if you get a chance to see it, you should see it. It's called Attack of the Bat Monsters. And because I did the special effects for Kelly, and I saw and I, I learned, you know, like like the the the, the way that the, uh, the independent uh, movies were being produced back then, I decided to make my own movie in three days, and that's how Terror Tunes came about. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I had a friend at the time who I was working for, and he said uh, he would put up the money for the film. All I need, I asked for twenty five hundred dollars to make the movie, and we made the movie for actually for twenty three hundred dollars. It came in under budget. And, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, uh, I, I, it, it happened so fast. My friend, my best friend from high school, his name is Rudy Bali, who actually wrote Ceremony, wrote the wrote the screen, uh, the draft we went into shooting with of Terror Tunes. Uh, he lives like four miles from me, and he wrote wrote the first draft of the screenplay, and um, with me. And uh, you know, uh, we had a like an audition slash um, uh, script reading, like two weeks before we started shooting, or maybe even a week before we started shooting. And everybody that showed up got to be in the movie. That's the way it went down. Because it was only like, you know, I didn't know anybody at the time here in LA. Uh, I had just come back from Texas and um, I was introducing some new people and uh, we decided to make this movie. I said, look, I can't pay you anything. We're gonna make the movie for $2,500. Uh, it'll be three days of your time. And when we're done, you'll never have to come back to set and, uh, and you'll have a movie, a feature film on your credit. And, um, and they said, yeah, they would do it, you know. Um, so the first day we shot was a 12 hour day. And the second day we shot on a Saturday, it was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The second day we shot was a 17 hour day. And then the third day was a 25 hour day because it went all the way from Sunday to Monday morning when the birds were coming up and people were driving away to work. And uh, that's how Terror Tunes came about. And you know, when it was done, it sat on the shelf at Blockbuster right next to Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, it doesn't matter how much money you spent on it. Did it go to the same market, the same place where everybody else got an option? Do you want to see Pirates of the Caribbean? Or do you want to see this crazy weird thing over here? You know, most, most, most nerds, most of us would go for the crazy weird thing. We know that uh, Pirates of the Caribbean is always going to be there. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Very it's cool. kind of like, like luck the way that that one came about. But yeah, I mean, we didn't have anybody telling us we couldn't do this. You can't do that. Um, that's too weird. Don't do that, you know. And uh, we just ran with it. Cool. I'm, I'm, thank you for sharing that with me. It makes me very happy to hear that it inspired you and it entertained you. And um, yeah, it means the world. It makes it all worthwhile. Thank you, Mike. Sure. What are some of your influences as, as a filmmaker? Who are some of your favorite directors <sighs> or some of your favorite uh, movies? That's a great question. Um, let's see. Wow. <laughs> Um, you know, there are, there are so many, there's just so many over the years, you know, um, and so many, uh, ones that I'm now re-experiencing in this pandemic as we won't go back and watch all these old movies that we haven't seen in, in years. Um, but there's bits and pieces of everybody. I mean, off the top of my head, I probably have to go to like David Cronenberg, you know, mm -hmm. uh, rabbit was I actually have a, a, the, the, the Thai poster rabbit hanging right above my desk right here. Yeah, I, I don't know what about that film. I mean, if I go back and watch it today, there's just so many memorable things from that film that influenced me as a, as a young person. Um, and then, of course, uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis, all of the Fulci films, and um, uh, Toby Hooper and Steven Spielberg teaming up to make Culture Guys. You know, I, I saw that movie 12 times in the movie theater. This is, you know, uh, it came out in 1982, the year I bought the video camera. And um, I used to take a different friend each time because I would love to see my 12 year old friend get the shit scared out of him every time the clown grabbed the boy or the, you know, the, the, the tree came in through the, uh, the, the window. And, um, you know, that was that movie is still magical today to me. Yeah. 
So tell us about your work with uh, practical effects and then going to digital effects. Now, did you prefer one over the other? That's a great question. That's a great question. Well, practical effects for me <clears throat> uh, can be learned as a skill, but what I do with practical effects, I think cannot. I use practical effects as like a magic, kind of like a, like a, like a magician more will use them. I try to, if I can make a special effect that fools even other special effects artists, then I've done my job, you know, and I try to use materials and concepts and techniques that are uh, non-traditional when it comes to doing my special effects. And uh, now that I'm also a visual effects artist and can use digital effects in my films, I um, like to use a smooth medium of both, a blend of both. Uh, if I can use all practical and then composite them digitally, that's the way I like to go with it. Uh, but I prefer practical effects because not everybody can do it. Not every, you know, uh, people, you, you can learn techniques and tools and presets on a computer program to make a practical effect, uh, which I think takes a lot of the magic out of what we see today in movies. But to actually produce and create with your hands a practical effect and then photograph it, it's just nothing, nothing takes the place from it. I've never seen a digital effect be scary. Oh, uh, yeah. I agree. You, know, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't make a digital ghost be scary. You know, digital monsters are not terrifying. Um, so, yeah, digital blood is not gory. You know, uh, uh, so there will always be a, a place for both of them, I think. But uh, I would have to say I prefer practical over the digital. Technical error where Joe is discussing his mentor Herschel Gordon Lewis and his desire to remake The Wizard of Gore. Can, can I, can, will you let me remake The Wizard of Gore? And he said, absolutely, I would let you remake it. But I don't own it anymore, Joe. That's what he said. Ugh. What most people don't know is that Herschel lost the copyrights to all of his movies. Mm -hmm. At one point. Oh at one point. And that's why he didn't remake any of them. Um, and um, he, 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 he lost them in a way that was a shady business deal. Um, he, 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 if, I, if I'm correct, I may be mistaken, but he used his movies as collateral to take out a bank loan. And something happened and the bank sold the movies. Oh, no. That's yeah. terrible. And so, um, but, um, but you know, uh, have, you, have you seen the movie Juno? Have you seen the movie Juno? Yeah. It's like one, of my, one, of my, one of my favorite stories. I remember when the girl is, you know, has the guy over to her house for the very first time. And she's like, have you ever seen The Wizard of Gore? I mean, she's, oh, like, yeah. she's like flirting with him, you know, and even <laughs> the Wizard of Gore. And, and, and he's like, no, I've never seen that. He goes, you've never seen the Wizard of Gore. You've got to see it. They're and uh, arguing about if Argento or Herschel Gordon Lewis was better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he said that one day, he told me, he goes, Joe, one day, because I didn't even know they used my name or the movie, whatever, in the film. Because one day he goes, a giant check just showed up from Hollywood. And I was like, that's great. That's fantastic. So, <laughs> yeah, he's just an amazing, amazing man. Um, yeah, uh, when we were working on Blood Feast 2, uh, I did this scene where this girl gets her head skinned. And um, I made a puppet. I made a, like a puppet that we could put real skin, a duplicate of her skin on. And then we pulled it off. And then the puppet's eyes moved and the mouth moved. And um, you know, I made it very realistic. And uh, on the first take, I pulled it off. He's like, "That's not gory enough." <laughs> like, what do you mean? He goes, "Make it gorier." And I, 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 so I put more slime and more blood, and he did it again. He goes, "That's not really gross enough." And I'm like, "How else do you want it to be, Herschel?" He goes, "Come here." So we went over to like the craft service table, and I think we had, had like Kentucky Fried Chicken that day. I think it was. And he put like mashed potatoes and some gravy in the blood, and then he put some pieces of chicken meat and crumpled up some bread and. Coleslaw. It's like everything from Kentucky Fried Chicken you put in it. You know, I go and slap that on and part of it. Let's see what it looks like. He goes, yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> so, so yeah. uh, like I was, I was asking you before, uh, when you write, direct, and produce a film, and you also do the special effects and the makeup, how do you balance all that on set? Oh, that's a great question. Um, how do I balance directing and writing and producing and special effects all at once on set? Well, that's where my partner, Steven Escobar, comes in. We just, my partner, Steven Escobar, has a, he's an Emmy for outstanding editing in reality television programming. He's also a producer and a writer. And um, 
Uh, recently, we, we made recently we uh, we released our 18th feature film, uh, well, my 18th directorial film. Uh, I think it was the 11th one that we did together, and it's a movie titled Xenophobia, and uh. it's great. We work together as a team, you know, and, uh, and and that's how big motion pictures are made. That's how studio films are made. Teamwork. Yes, it's great as an independent filmmaker to be the director and be in charge of everything, but it's not always the best. It's always, uh, it's been my experience. If you want to make a movie look bigger and bolder and more professional, you need to have more heads together working as a team. Yes, there can be one vision, mm -hmm. but having uh, having other people there to pick up the slack when, because we all make mistakes. Yeah. You know, no one's perfect. No one has all the answers, you know, and, uh, and it's great to have someone on set. So how do I do it? I bring in help. I bring in help that's at least as good as me, if not better. I like to challenge myself. I'd like to surround myself with people that are very professional. Um, a lot of people ask me, can I come intern for, be an intern for you, Joe? Can I help you? Sometimes it's actually more work to have someone there that doesn't know what they're doing than to have to go ahead and pay somebody a little bit of money and have someone there and do and do what I need. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had people that wanted to come over and help me while I'm building something, and I, I, it's like I'm paying for a bit. I'm paying I'm paying them to babysit them. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. It just doesn't work that way, you know. I and yeah. um, you know the, the 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 gap between someone who's beginning and someone with 38 years is so wide and so vast. Um, it's, um, it, it can be, uh, it can be very challenging to have someone around me when I'm producing something or creating something that basically I've never done before. I mean, I, 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 I like I said, I try to be truly original with everything I make. So if I'm experimenting you know, and trying to figure it out, it's very difficult to have someone there, uh, trying to help me and assist me with that. I mean, uh, they're great for, for motivation and for support. <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, I, I do. I, I don't want to sound snotty. I do appreciate having. A, I do have uh, interns and assistants, and I have people that uh, help me, uh, uh, like being like production managers when it comes to me team shows. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this new movie that just came out. It's called Exorcism at Sixty Thousand Feet. Oh uh, yeah. You know, it stars uh, 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 Lance Erickson and. Matthew Moe, I have a whole bunch of names written down here because there's a whole bunch of stars in it. Adrian Barbeau's in it, Bill Mosley, Robert Ryan, the producer, also has a role in it. Uh, uh, let's see, Kevin J. O'Connor, who probably has one of the best lines of any horror movie. Um, uh, one of my favorite creature features is a movie called Deep Rising. Have you ever seen Deep Rising? Oh, yeah, I've seen that one. That, you know when they're in the elevator going up or down in the elevator and the girl from Ipanema comes on in the elevator and Ke Ke Kevin G. O'Connor says, uh, I forget what he said. I now forget what he says. He says, yeah, he says the girl from Ipanema, I think is what he says, uh, yeah. as they're going down to basically be mutilated by some creature. And yeah. uh, he's in the film. So it has this all-star cast. If you like uh, a lot of like gags and laughs, like the original Airplane, uh, mixed with a little bit of horror icon, stuff uh, you'll love the exorcism at 60,000 feet and uh, at the time I keyed that show uh, Maricela Lascano La La Lascano is her last name <laughs> Maricela I call her Maricela I've known her as Maricela uh, she uh, was my uh, my uh, special effects uh, manager at the time on set and she helped me keep all my ducks in a row I couldn't have done it without her I mean it was like gag after gag after gag on set and not only did I do all of the practical effects in the movie, I also produced 122 visual effects shots for the film. Uh -huh. And um, I just, you know, I have a lot of crazy stories about that movie. Uh, I wouldn't say scandal, but I will say, you know, it was probably one of the most challenging films I've worked on. Uh, I would ask for two hours to do an effect and they would give me 15 minutes in front of the camera. <laughs> and uh, in fact, one, one of the scenes, uh, there's a guy who's having sex with a girl who's possessed by a demon in the bathroom on an airplane. And um, let's just say he melts at one point. And oh. uh, I was going to do all these different stages of melting makeup on him. And uh, I was going to have two hours to do it. And they said, you only got 15 minutes. He's walking off set 15 minutes. So I literally grabbed Italian salad dressing and blood and ran over to set and was pouring stuff on his head as he's acting. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, the, um, 
regular makeup artists. There were this, this basically coven of makeup artists. Let's say I, I have a bad, bad rapport with makeup artists because makeup artists want my job. All makeup artists want to do this effect stuff. So the makeup artists on the shoot, they just despised me. They just hated me because they all wanted to get their fingers in what I was doing. So while I was pouring um, Italian salad dressing and blood on this guy's head, they were literally screaming, "You can't do that! You, you can't put salad dressing on him. It'll go into his eyes. It'll blind him. What, what's in that blood? That's toxic. You can't use that." And the um, assistant director came over to me while I was in between takes and stuck his finger on the guy's face and went. Yeah, that's salad dressing. Keep going, <laughs> and um, you know it's just like whatever. And then uh, the last stage of the makeup is you know his face is really melting, and I literally went over with a wet paper towel and just wiped his face down. And I think I used spray adhesive on the back of the appliance and stuck it on his face, and then poured more stuff on top of it. That's all the time I had, and it turned out amazing. <laughs> it turned out amazing. So I had this like, like literally a group of villainous makeup artists over here trying to destroy my effect, and I had the uh, assistant director carrying me on. And when the whole sequence was done, the executive producer came up to me and patted me on the back and said, "Only you could have done that show." Because the guy okay. wanted to get the hell out of set. The actor he <laughs> he had like he, I think he was going to like LAX after his shoot, so he was like pressed for time. And I only had 15 minutes to do this effect. But it's a memorable story I will never forget, and the, the scene turned out really well. Yeah. Well, I would I would encourage our I would encourage our listeners to watch the trailer for Exorcism at sixty thousand feet. It looks crazy, batshit, insane, and it looks like it, 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 it illustrates what we t- talked about before about the mixture of practical effects and digital effects. It looks like a great mixture of both. It, it is fun. It's got some fun stuff in it. One of my favorite scenes in it is. There's a an, a girl who's possessed by a demon. And she's pregnant, and she gives birth to her baby in the middle of the aisle on the airplane. And I did it as a practical effect, and um, it looks like she's been squeezed like a like a tube of toothpaste, like this, you know, and, and it pops out of her. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite effects of the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, no, absolutely. See the film. You know, some amazing people I met on that set. Um, I got a chance to work with Adrian Barbo. I got to make uh, this little this little uh, rabid dog puppet that uh, rips off her scalp. I got to pour blood on Adrian Barbo. I mean, who, that's just like a dream come true. I, like, I, I don't know how to express that. That's a dream come true. And she's such a kind, amazing person. You know, um, I love encountering movie stars and actors and producers and writers that use their star power for good. You know, and I've been, I've encountered so many people, excuse me, over the years that do this. Forrest Jackman was one. Brink Stevens is one. Uh, Felissa Rose is an amazing human being. She's one of these people that do this. And, um, you know, Adrian Barbo. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I just, it, it's like men and women like this that make the world a better place and in, in the industry. And they do it with love and care, understanding. And they freely give what has been given to them in a way that makes, just makes it all worthwhile. You know, everybody has struggles. We all have struggles. Trying to get where we want to go, and these are the kind of people that make it worthwhile. When does this movie come out, and uh, where can the audience watch this? You can watch Exorcism at sixty thousand feet now. It's on Amazon, on demand, and uh, on all home media platforms. And you can buy it as a. I think it comes out. It's already out as a dual DVD, Blu-ray pack. I think it's loaded with behind-the-scenes extras, and I bet you there's some crazy stuff in the behind-the-scenes extra. Let's put it this way, and I, you know, I'm not going to say this as a scandal, or in a negative light. But uh, let me see. Should I even say it? No, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to leave it out. <laughs> I was going to leave it out altogether. I think I'm just going to ex name what I was going to say. You know, I just yeah, it was a uh, it was a wild time on set. There was some crazy stuff going down. Yeah. Well, there's there's a little there's a little flash on the trailer that shows uh, a woman with a huge forked tongue. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. That looks amazing. I honestly can't tell if it's practical or digital. That's practical. Yeah, I made that practical. Yeah, we shot almost everything practical, and then it was enhanced. Some of it was enhanced digitally, and some of the stuff didn't make it in, and some of the stuff did. And you know, there was a lot of stuff. Uh, I think the first cut of the movie was four hours long. Oh wow! That was, that wow. was, that, that, was that much material, and they had to whittle it down. Yeah. So some yeah. of it made it in, some of it didn't make it in. You know, it is a comedy piece. The whole, the whole piece is a comedy piece. 
starring horror icons. It is it is a, it's a full blown comedy. You know, if you like the original, like I said, Airplane or uh, the scary movies kind of movies, then that that's what it is. You know, that's what you, you don't expect to be terrified or scared or you know, uh, and even the gross stuff is brightly colored and done in fun. Uh, but there's some good stuff in it. Yeah. You uh, you just said that you had to do a makeup effect to somebody's melting head within 15 minutes, and you thought you were going to do two hours, which sounds like a challenge. Is this the most challenging effect you've ever done? And if not, what is the most challenging special effect you've yeah. ever created? Yeah, that's, that's going to be a difficult question to answer. I, I, m most of the directors that I work with have not had the level of on-set experience that I have working on special effects. So, the, and, and not to blame them or judge them, but they just don't know how to manage the time it actually takes to do what I'm asking them, what I'm asking for, uh, you know, that, that amount of time. So, you know, I, I'm always shortchanged, you know. Um, I worked on a film recently, it's called Amityville Harvest, and um, it stars uh, Eileen Dietz is in the film. Eileen Dietz plays the Pazuzu, the demon from The Exorcist, who also did all of uh, the stand-in uh, stunt work and makeup work for Linda Blair. In fact, Eileen is the uh, person who's actually wearing the possessed makeup when the vomit comes out of her mouth. And she's actually uh. the, 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 uh, the possessed uh, face in those black and white shots, uh, those, those black shots where you see the demon riding on the bed and it's going, ah, that's Eileen Dietz. And there's a scene in the film where she has uh, a heavy ap appliance on and uh, she has to kill somebody. Of course, it's the last shot of the day. We literally have 15 minutes before they have to start wrapping camera and they send the victim to my makeup chair. And <laughs> I thought I would get like, a, like an hour to put this face on to kill this person. Um, uh, so, and the set was two minutes away from the, the makeup room. So it took two minutes to get the, the girl there. I have to put on the makeup and then I have to return her to set with enough time for them to shoot the shot so they can wrap it. <laughs> so that's yeah, I think I had approximately six minutes to put the makeup on when I wanted it at least an hour. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and it turned out great. It yeah. turned out great though. It turned out great. I'll post some pictures of it on my Facebook page soon when the movie's released. Yeah. You mentioned some of the classic horror films that inspired you. What are some modern horror films that you think are great? Oh, that's a great question. Um, let me see. Uh, wow, I'm gonna get. I hope I don't get. I don't get. Uh, 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 I don't. Uh, let me see. Mm, that's a that's a good question. I, I, I the first one that comes to mind is the remake of Evil Dead, and I know a lot of people don't like it, but I thought they did an amazing job with it. I really, really do. I think they did a great job with the film. Um, horror films. I you know, I have I have a real fondness for. Um, uh, and uh, I think it was I think it was Annabelle. Yeah. The first one, Annabelle. I was in the movie theater. It was Halloween. I think it was the day before Halloween. It was released on, on in the month of October, and uh, the movie theater wasn't too crowded, but just crowded enough. And there was a like a Latino gangbanger and his girlfriend sitting behind us. And there's a shot in the movie where this black jet black demon is on the ceiling crawling around. And I swear to God, the 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 gangbanger screamed like a howled like a woman. With a, with a had a rat crawling up his foot, Hi! like that, you know, he was so <laughs> terrified. I love going to movies that are that, that are that, you know, that, that, that people get that engrossed to it and can be scared by it. Yeah, like Annabelle and uh, the, the remake of The Evil Dead, and um, yeah, uh, any, any movie that doesn't really take itself too seriously, but and also a lot of people these days are trying to make movies to be famous, and that's not why people make movies. You make movies to entertain people. I think one of the one of the only crimes a movie can make is to be boring, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, a movie either entertains the person who's watching it or it doesn't. Movies are neither good or bad. You know, if it doesn't entertain you, it doesn't make it bad. Because mm -hmm. somewhere on this planet, someone loves a movie that you don't like. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Everybody's taste is, is definitely unique. So right. you have 29 projects upcoming that we, like we mentioned earlier. How are you even, managing? I didn't even know I had 29. <laughs> oh, okay. How are you managing everything that you do while being while the lockdown situation is in effect? Mm, that's a good question. Well, how do I manage my time uh, working on all these films during this lockdown? I, I, my my schedule has not changed at all. I still work. I have a 
you know, I'm very uh, grateful to have uh, space to work in that my partner Steven has provided for me. Uh, he gave me the entire garage for my effects studio. I have a, a full blown effects studio here in Hollywood, California. And uh, I primarily work by myself anyways, unless I'm taking a live cast of an actor or, uh, you know, meeting with someone, which we can now do on Zoom. I'm working by myself, sculpting in the garage, mold making, pouring it up. And I like to stay in com constant communication with directors anyway, through social media, through the FaceTime and whatnot. So I, it, nothing has really changed for me. This has actually been a blessing in many ways. Uh, and um, I like to be given you know, an ample amount of time to create stuff. You know, One of the things that big Hollywood studios get a chance to do is prototype and spend uh, a, a good deal of time perfecting what they're doing. And a lot of independent films don't get the chance to do that. They rush into it and they rush through the process and then, they're, then they deal with the mistakes afterwards. And that's not what a big Hollywood studio film does. They prototype, they get together, they discuss what is right, what is wrong, and how they can be made better. And so I'm using that time to do exactly that with the directors and the creative people that I'm working with. So you so, haven't slowed down at all. Say that um, again? You haven't slowed down at all then. Oh, I, no, actually I've taken out three more movies since this thing started. So besides your uh, IMDb profile, where can our listeners keep up with all your work? Absolutely. Great question. If you want to reach me, I'm on Facebook every day. And uh, you can reach me there at facebook.com backslash Joe.Castro. Send me a friend request, but more importantly, send me a message. Say hello. And let's talk about making movies. Um, I always try to re I would always reach out to anybody. Uh, if you send me a friend request and you don't say hello to me, I'll always send you a message first and say hello. How are you doing? What's going on? Uh, you know, I like the people. I like uh, people on my Facebook page to uh, participate in Facebook as opposed to just hanging out. And uh, and I'm very uh, very easily reached and um, uh, I'm very uh, very easy to communicate with when it comes to talking about independent films and working on projects. Uh, you know, talk with me and let's see if we can make something happen. See if we can make a movie happen. Also yeah. for Insta Instagram, I'm. Uh, uh, Joe underscore Castro underscore director, uh, but I'm not there as much. So uh, yeah, the best way to reach me is Facebook. Yeah. yeah, that's that's actually what you done with me. I sent you a friend request and then you sent me a message. Yes, I was like, oh, very cool. And then I I really enjoy your posts. Like I really like when you uh, do digital effects and stuff, and you made those maggots. And you said like you don't like seeing in these films where you don't have to kill a bunch of maggots. You can make them just look just as real with it, digital effects. That's right. And also, it doesn't make your film more impressive to have to kill a real bug or have a real dead animal in your film. It doesn't actually make it more impressive. It actually is in a big way and it's sad. Um, I mean, as artisans, we have the capability to create these things. It's, a, it's actually a real passion of mine to make sure and to instill in upcoming directors and filmmakers that we do not uh, put dead animal parts in our films. Even intestines and uh, animal parts, uh, these things can be produced in silicone and rubber and latex, and it doesn't make your movie any more, any more popular or spectacular when you use a real animal part. Um, and, um, you know, it's sad to see food go to waste and to see uh, another living creature sacrificed at the expense of someone else's entertainment, which is the way that I view it. In fact, um, you know, watching old Italian zombie films and splatter films, I, um, I tend to, uh, I, I don't relish in them anymore because that, they had a tendency to do that quite a bit. And, um, you know, I've grown up, I've changed. My view and my perspective has changed. And so I encourage people, if you want to uh, do something that you think can't be accomplished by hurting another creature or using dead animal parts, to come to me and I will show you and help you make it happen. Yeah. Cool. Your mentor was Herschel Gordon Lewis. You got to hang around on the Evil Dead 2 set. You um, were around Robocop. Do you feel like you're a piece of horror history because you have such connection <laughs> to the genre? Wow, that's um, that's, uh, that's a big, big pair of shoes to fill. I uh, would like to think I am, mm -hmm. and I hope that I am remembered as such. And, um, you know, I kind of feel like I've just begun. I'm 50 years old, and I kind of feel like I've just begun. I mean, Herschel uh, died at 84, and I still that would mean I still got another 34 years, and I I kind of feel like I've just begun, uh, like five years ago. 
I don't, I don't, I don't, I, you know, yes, I accomplished a whole bunch of stuff in, in my, in my, in my twenties and thirties, but now reaching the age of 50, I think I feel like I've just begun. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I've been around, um, long enough to have touched literally the faces and actors and actresses at the hands of Dick Smith, you know, have touched. I, mean, I, I worked with Eileen Dietz from the original Exorcist. I worked with Adrian Barbeau. I literally poured blood on her face, <laughs> and uh, you know, put with, with George Romero. I'm good friends with his son now, and um, you know, I'm just carrying the torch along, uh, and uh, I, I hope that I can I can basically inspire others to do the same, and uh, to make the world a better place, one special effect at a time, one movie at a time. You know, well, and not, not hurt anybody on the way up. That's well, that just. Just in this interview today, you have really inspired me. And I just really appreciate you coming on today and giving us your insight and all this great information and all this these pieces of horror history. And I, I just hope to get to work with you one day. It would be a pleasure and an honor. And if either of you are ever out in the Los Angeles area, please let me know in advance. I tell everybody this, but you guys, if you're coming out here, let me know in advance. We can get together, have dinner, have a cup of coffee, talk shop. And make some movies. Sir, it would be an honor to collaborate with someone like you and someone who has your history. Oh, thank you very much for saying that. I appreciate that very much. Before we go, I wanted to ask you, do you have a favorite horror movie or a handful of favorite horror movies? I do. The top five. Here we go. Okay, let's hear it. <laughs> David Cronenberg's Rabbit, The Gates of Hell, Poltergeist, Blood Feast, and Godzilla versus the Smog Monster. Oh, so you've had this list prepared. You already knew. Oh yeah, no, this is this is like hands down. Yeah, this is where it all begins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can find a little bit of everything in those films. You can find a little bit of everything that you like about cinema in those five movies. At one time, there was this movie called Return to Paradise. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it stars Anne Heche and um, I forget his name. The guy that uh, um, that starred in the remake of Psycho. And um, also, um, Vince Vaughn. Yeah, Vince Vaughn and uh, Joaquin Phoenix is in it. And if you've never seen it, it's not a horror movie, but it is horrifying. And if you get a chance to watch it, you should watch it. It's called Return to Paradise. It will literally change your whole perception of filmmaking. And but I, I keep it off the list because it's just that it, it, it's not really horror. Most people probably won't see it, but it's horror films and what shaped and molded me is that. But yeah, if you get a chance to see Return to Paradise, I highly suggest that. It. It's just a creepy, creepy, you just twisted, sick movie. <laughs> Actually, because you recommended it, I will be watching it yeah, sometime sure. this week as soon as I can get a hold of it. Yeah. And I cannot wait to take a deeper dive into your work. And, and I hope we can have you back on again after we watch a few more of your movies and we can uh, do a little deeper dive into those. Absolutely. And I just want to let everybody know that Terror Tunes 1, 2, and 3 are available right now on Amazon Prime, along with The Summer of Massacre. So if you want to go get filled up on Joe Castro, cult cinema, it's there for the for the eaten. And we definitely plan on watching Exorcism at 60,000 feet and discussing that on the podcast. Yes. Fantastic. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. All right, Joe, we wanted to thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate that you gave us so much. You are... A fantastic interview and you've like I could tell that you're a really awesome human being a really good person thank you James I appreciate that both of you are as well really, really good. thank you All right, gentlemen. Care, have a beautiful rest of your day thank all right you, you too. too take care Bye -bye. Joe Bye -bye. horror show exclusive we hope you enjoyed that interview with Joe Castro folks I certainly had a blast interviewing him he's such a warm person I cannot wait to collaborate with him one day yeah, that was such a great interview. We had no idea it'd be so comprehensive and so, uh, he told so many stories and, and so much insight into the filmmaking process. It was just great to talk to him. Yes, that guy is a piece of history as far as I'm concerned. Well, folks, that's all we have for you today. Till next week, happy, happy horror. horror.